right, this, this morning, uh, Pastor wanted me to talk on winning the lost to Christ. So before I get started, I'm going I'm to say a little prayer because I have because there's no sufficiency in me to do this. Father God, we pray that your, that your Holy Spirit will be in our midst today. You've promised to be in our midst. You said we're two or three are gathered in your name. You're right there with us. Lord God, I, I have no confidence in the flesh as I stand up here uh, this morning, but if you have something to say to your people, then I invite you to use me. And I pray that we will all be fed uh, from the bread from heaven and from your holiness this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. So winning the loss for Christ. Uh, Corey, Corey's got a little uh, slideshow for me going on back there. Yep, here we go. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 11.30 that he who wins souls is wise. That's from the New American Standard Version. Well, what does it mean to win a soul? Well, let's look at this first from the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible is the most accurate translation in the English language uh, that we have to convey to us the very ideas and thoughts of God as he gave them to the authors. In this case, King Solomon, he writes, The fruit of the uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise captures human lives for God. As a fisher of men, he gathers and receives them for eternity. Okay, so what does that mean? It means the evidence. That's what fruit is. It's evidence. Think in terms of a fruit tree. An apple hanging from the branch of a tree is evidence that the tree is an apple tree because it produces that which it is ingrained in its DNA to reproduce. So again, what does it mean? How much you were fruited, how much you were fruited, there's supposed to be a picture of a fruit tree, or a, a, a tree, there we go, yeah, how much you were fruited depends how deeply you are rooted. How much time and energy and devotion are you putting into your time with God through prayer, study, fellowship one with another, being community, because as deep as our roots go down, that's how much fruit we're going to bear our, you know, for others to see. Or you, th or, you can, or you can think in terms of an iceberg. There's a little bit above the water, and there's a mountain beneath the water. Uh, the evidence of those who do not compromise their walk with God is that they produce the God kind of life. And whoever reprodu reproduces the God kind of life by living a God-centered and God-honoring life, even in secret, captivates and commands the attention of human lives around them that he or she is in a relationship with and leads them into a relationship with the Almighty God through his word and their lifestyle. That's the idea this passage conveys. So we must ask ourselves, what's the evidence uh, of my life in Christ re reproducing? Are people being one to Christ because of my prayers, my Bible study, my time alone with God? Have I ever been able to lead anybody to Christ because they noticed the God kind of life evident in me and wanted a taste of him for themselves? Psalms 34, 8 tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he who takes refuge in him. To have a taste for something or someone means there must be an appetite for consumption. So what or who are we hungry for? Do we wake up every morning like this? hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God in our lives? Or are we just distracted? Uh, so, you, know, you know, the first thing to do, the first thing we should do, you know, get up and pray and thank God. But I got to admit, as I stand up here, sometimes the first thing I do, I go check out Facebook. <laughs> See what people was saying overnight and early in the morning, you know, who, got, who I can connect with, you know, from uh, my life back in Missouri or uh, people I know over in England or uh, are scattered around the country, you know. It's good to keep up with people, but it's, but it's but it's best to keep up with God. Jesus tells us, "Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled." Our main idea today is in winning. The big idea is in winning souls to Christ is that we must first ourselves individually and corporately hunger and thirst. For the righteousness of Christ in our own lives because a tree and a person 
only reproduces after its own kind. An apple tree. When's the last time you saw an apple tree growing watermelons? When's the last time you saw a peach tree growing lemons? What you are on the inside, where nobody but God can see, that's what you're going to reproduce. And the passage from Proverbs 11:30 says, "If we are wise, we will captivate the attention of people for the kingdom of God." So, what does it mean to be wise? Well, as I was writing this down this morning, I believe the Holy Ghost gave me a, uh, a little definition: winning and salvation etiquette is wisdom. It, it's it's practical. So. Wait, there's an etiquette to winning souls? I thought etiquette was just for like dinner parties and social functions. But etiquette is defined as the customary code of polite behavior in a society or among members of a particular profession or group. Synonyms are protocol, manners, accepted behavior, rules of conduct, decorum, and good form. We are the members of the body of Christ if we profess him as our king, our savior, our redeemer. What do you think the marriage supper of the Lamb will look like? When we come into this place, it's practice for the marriage supper. You think sometimes maybe our etiquette towards visitors or other members might need re-examined? Are we polite with those we have differing opinions with? Are we friendly and open with one another? We all bring something to the table. Second idea, Jesus said in John 13:35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, if you keep on showing or demonstrating love among yourselves. Again, that's the amplified version. So then how do we show love for one another? If we mean to impact our world as part of our creed states, you know, uh, growing, growing in God and growing with one another and impacting our world. So if we, so if we hope to impact our world, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one friends is what Jesus taught the concept of the passage is this am I looking out for the interest of others or am I so self-absorbed or self-preserving or self-consumed that I have no time interest desire or capability to help another if the unsaved and unchurched do not see us exemplifying the life of Christ in our actions towards each other why do they want what we don't have we produce what we are nothing more and nothing less I must look into the mirror of truth and ask myself what is the evidence in my life telling people about me about Christ in me about my priorities is the Holy Spirit of God inside me flowing through me able to impact the life of another or is there so much garbage and clutter in my life that he is hindered in reaching others through me Oftentimes, when a couple is unable to reproduce, they consult a fertility doctor, take fertility drugs, or they'll adopt the child into their home. Likewise, if we're not reproducing for the kingdom of God in some kind of way, maybe it's time we consult with the great physician and see what our part in this reproductive process is, or how we can be treated through his word and his spirit so his desired result can be made manifest in our lives in our sphere of influence, in our workplace, and in our community. Third idea, salvation begins at home. I'm going to read for you Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. And then verse 20 through 25. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgment which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your sons and your grandsons, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now verse 20 through 25. When your son asks you in times to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe, against Pharaoh, Egypt, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. especially verses 6 through 9, communicating the goodness of God to our offspring. Uh, a lot of us probably have grown children up in here. Uh, so some of us don't, but I mean, when, when uh, the, the, way that, the way that these verses have application for us, or, or, when, our, or when our grandkids even. You know, if, if, you're, if your grandkids or your kids are flipping through a picture book and they see you in your life before Christ, you know, my hair was way out to here, you know. Might have been a cigarette or some weed dangling from my lip. Might have been a beer over in this hand, you know. And, and they asked me, how come, you know, I'm no longer like that? What, 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 what's the difference? I say, well, it's because cause Jesus Christ came into my life. I realized after, after dancing with the devil for so long that there was a price to pay at the end of it. And I didn't like the price that I had to pay, which was, you know, uh, losing my first family but I, at least I escaped with my health and God raised me up uh, to a better place than I was at so th th these are the kinds of things I can tell them to my grandsons you know? uh, my, my son he was raised with me part time and, you know, and, I, and I, I did my best to communicate to him the things that God has brought me through now he's growing it's up to him whether he wants to stay on that path and be blessed or not and so it goes with all our children but the home is where it begins. A poll by the Barna Research Group in 2015 revealed that 13 is the average age that people become Christians. The median age is 11. The majority of respondents, 63%, accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord while they were between the ages of 4 and 14, suggesting that most people who become Christians do so during those ages. A 2004 Barna study indicated 64% of those who come to Christ do so before their 18th birthday. Another study done by the International Bible Society tells us 83% of all Christians make their commitment to Jesus between the ages of 4 and 14. So both of those, I mean, they don't exactly have the same percentages, but they have the same age groups, 4 to 14. Anybody here raised in a Christian home or a Catholic home? See how, that, see how that come back up in our, in our life. So we got that same responsibility to our children. Teach them going forward. And hopefully our children will go further in God than what we have. We live in perilous times. Many of the children in America are afraid to go to school because school shooters seem to be increasing in our society. Public schools have banned God from the classroom and pushed his Ten Commandments out the door. The government and the teachers' union have pushed political correctness down our kids' throats. They indoctrinate them with sexual preferences in kindergarten. The ages of 4 to 14 are being assaulted and manipulated to fit a political agenda, and it's not God's agenda. Our kids are being taught, God isn't real. There's no purpose for their lives. And being a good Christian means being intolerant and then they have to dodge bullets. Timothy Smith in his book, The Seven Cries of Today's Teens writes, the culture in the main no longer supports the family as a viable unit. 
In fact, our society does not protect the family, nor does it affirm child rearing as a noble task. A lot of the times the state thinks they have more rights than you. That's why uh, you know they might need your consent to give your child an aspirin or a Tylenol, but if your child, if your 13, 14 year old child wants an abortion, they don't have to tell you about it. Something is wrong, something is upside down. Our children must be impacted toward Christ. He is their only hope, not the classroom, not the campus, not the cops, not even the president. But kids are being impacted and influenced away from God in our out of control culture. Satan targets children. All through the Bible, he comes after the babies to destroy them from being used for God's purposes. Pharaoh had male babies drowned in ancient Egypt, but Moses was raised in his own household anyway. King Herod targeted babies two years old and under for death, trying to make sure Jesus didn't survive. We need to be praying for the children in our homes, our communities, our families to be influenced towards Christ. He is the only one who can give their lives meaning and purpose. And as we influence them with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can also encourage them to progress in what they've been taught. 2 Timothy 1.5 points out the progression of Timothy's faith. Paul writes to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. Faith in God can be reproduced into our children if we make the effort at home. Paul continues with Timothy's part in keeping that faith prominent in his own life. He says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And lastly, Pastor wanted me to mention that a church is a Christ-centered community. Uh, so we're going to turn into uh, Acts 4, 32 and 35. Probably just should have pulled it up on my phone. It would have been quicker, huh? All right. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need that that's that's a powerful picture of community I don't know of any church really that that, that, that has practiced what was in the first century church where people are actually giving up real estate selling it for the fair market value and then bring in the whole bundle of money to the church to be distributed to the poor or as anybody had need so that nobody was hurting in any kind of way now that is that that is really loving support and when, when we if, if if the modern church could get back to that, that that would be awesome but it takes a crisis that church was in crisis that church was being pursued that, per, that church was being told to shut up and don't talk about Jesus or you're going to be crucified like Jesus was crucified. But uh, so in conclusion, I told you this is going to be short today. We're going to be out here early, folks. <laughs> if we are wise, we will win souls with the life of Christ in us and through us. We demonstrate to the unsaved world around us that we belong to Christ and have become his disciples when we have genuine love for one another and are willing to sacrifice to meet the needs of each other. And winning the lost begins at home by influence our, influencing our children for the purpose, plan, and call of God upon our lives.